Now I would request Professor Berners-Kony to speak about the book. Thank you. <coughs> distinguished guests, distinguished panelists, it's an extraordinary honor for me just to be speaking in front of you and one I'm hardly worthy of. Uh, it's a particular honor to be part of this panel introducing a challenging, original book by two young, extraordinarily talented and important thinkers. I am not up to the task of <coughs> introducing this book, in part because it would involve me having, first of all, to introduce them to you, which would be absurd. You already know them. And worse still, it would involve me introducing the theme of Gandhi and philosophy to you when you have been brought up all your lives in the shadow of Gandhi. So you would not expect, you would not want me to talk about the content of the book. And I'm sure the distinguished representative from Broomsbury would not want me to give the plot away, as that would <laughs> clearly uh, hurt sales. Uh, and I'm sure he wouldn't want me to do that. Although, spoiler alert, I will tell you what the ending is. So if any of you don't want to know the ending of the book, then I suggest that you leave now. <laughs> but come back later after I've finished. I think that one of the most remarkable things about the book is not only that it reads Gandhi with the same philosophical care and rigor with which for generations people had read Plato and Aristotle, Kant and Hegel. But also, it gives us a diagnosis of modernity and not a road map, but at least some indication of how we might face the challenges of modernity and move forward. I think We've already heard how difficult this book is to read. It's not a book that you will understand at <coughs> first reading. There are some beautiful aphorisms. Uh, I jotted one down. Uh, Freedom is inseparable from the fight for it. Now, I don't know whether Bloomsbury has any intention of marketing t-shirts. <laughs> but I, I would suggest that they might uh, have such a t-shirt and uh, sell it with a book. Uh, buy a t-shirt, get a book form. Buy a book and get a t-shirt. Uh, which are... The book is suffused with authors from Western philosophy. Uh, even for somebody who w has worked on Western philosophy all my life, I find myself struggling with these references from Deleuze and Derrida and Heidegger and Aristotle and so on and so on. Uh, and what is particularly strong about the book is it helps me to see these authors in new ways. Coming from outside Europe and North America, they approach these thinkers with a freedom that those of us who have been brought up in that tradition do not have. And as Nikhil Bergoff rightly says, they are not applying Western philosophy to Gandhi's thought. That's very important to understand as you read this book. Rather, in meeting the challenges of rereading Gandhi 
in this context. They are drawing as they see fit from Western philosophy and submitting many of these thinkers from Western philosophy to critique, to re-examination. And one of the things that I will be saying when I go back to the United States on Wednesday and encouraging my colleagues and friends to read this book is that they must understand this book in order to get a better understanding of the parochialism of Western philosophy. This is what comes across on every page of the book because they are addressing the issues of India today and looking at Western thought from there rather than applying Western philosophy to India. And so it is as if those of us who live in North America and Europe are listening in on a conversation which is taking place in India, as it should be. As I say, it's a challenging book to read. Familiar words that you think you understand the meaning of are used incongruously. And then only as you read throughout the book, occurrence after occurrence of these words, you get a new understanding of what that word might now mean. <coughs> Similarly, they adopt words that are, seem to be new words. They're certainly words that are new to me. And then slowly, as one reads the book, one comes to recognize what one can do with language. It is an experiment with language uh, that challenges us and gives us new resources so that we are no longer trying to uh, put new wine into old bottles. They are giving us the instruments which will help us think afresh. And so in closing, what I want to do is just read you the last paragraph, spoiler alert again, uh, and it will give you a sense of what uh, it's like to read this book. And I want to say enough about it uh, to show you why I think it is important for people to read this book. It's not for me to say what people in India should be doing, but I can at least tell people in North America and Europe what they should be doing. So this is the last uh, paragraph. It's one sentence. Anastasis is the obscure beginning which would gather the Occidental and the Oriental in order to make of them a chrysalis and set off the imagos born with their own spans and skies. These skies and the imagos set against them will refuse to trade in orientations. And these skies will be invisible to the departed souls of Hegel who sought Mercury in the darkest nights. Anastasis. This, this word was new to me. Maybe it was new to you when you invented it. Uh, I don't know where it was, came from somewhere else. I don't know. But Anastasis is, they say, the seizure of that which avoids stasis. Uh, the obscure beginning, which they also refer to as the new beginning, uh, is not the other beginning of Heidegger, though it has an interesting relation to it, I, I suspect. But it is what arises with what they call the new comprehending laws, which is the new uh, field that governs uh, it, law in general. And when they say that anastasis would gather the Occidental and the Oriental. They are not talking about geographical regions, but about tendencies, tendencies that have their own importance for politics. And when they say that this gathering of the Occidental and the Oriental 
is to, in order to make of them a chrysalis. Again, this is, uh, at first reading, I was a little puzzled by this. But when you read more closely, you understand that the chrysalis is what comes about when the new comprehending laws gather the components of previous critiques. And so why is these skies that this new beginning opens up, why are these skies invisible to poor old Hegel, uh, who is seeking Mercury? I haven't asked them. I deliberately, well, every time I wanted to ask them, they said, don't ask us yet. Wait until the session. So I have lots of questions for them later. But I wanted to ask why poor old Hegel. I know why he can't see the skies. But I was wondering why he was seeking Mercury. I think that might be the Philosopher's Stone. But th there are other references to Mercury in, in Hegel that they might be picking up on. So I don't know. But uh, I suspect that I am too old and too Western to be able to see these skies that I, like Hegel, uh, will be left seeking Mercury in the night. Uh, but for you, perhaps, there are other opportunities. Please buy this book. <laughs>